Father, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. You alone are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, St. Thomas. It's great to see everyone together. Great to see that you found your way from the garden uh, here into the city. Um, And you see that rhythm throughout the Gospels, especially Holy Week, from the garden to the city, back to the garden, back to the city. Um, And we, as a young church, we have entered now into uh, the city. And we come here on this special day where Jesus uh, has come into the holy city, riding on a young donkey. It's time for Holy Week. This most holy of weeks set apart and sacred where we walk slowly through that last week of the life of our Lord. Uh, Some of you know that usually there isn't even a sermon on Palm Sunday. (laughs) Just kidding. (laughs) But there's usually a really long gospel reading uh, on Palm Sunday. Instead of that, I just wanted to offer um, a sermon, a meditation for us as we enter into this new season in our church's life as we enter into this special season uh, of Holy Week. Um, And I actually think there's some background information needed that if you don't have this bit of information, Palm Sunday doesn't make sense, and the rest of the week doesn't make sense. Especially there's a twist that's going to happen on Thursday, which is that the crowd who cheers Jesus, crying out, Hosanna, save us, Later in the week, we'll cry out, crucify him. Uh, And what I want to share with you this morning, I think will help you make sense of that um, and and why they would have changed their mind so rapidly and how it actually makes sense uh, that they were so surprised at what Jesus did and the message that he brought on Palm Sunday. Because when Jesus entered into the holy city, He entered into Jerusalem. This doesn't say it here in the text, but they would have known that meant that he went through a specific gate, the eastern gate of the city, also known as uh, the Golden Gate, or or even in some places known as the Beautiful Gate. You might know in Acts chapter 3, right after Pentecost, the apostles heal uh, a man who's lame right at this beautiful gate on the east side of Jerusalem. It was one of eight gates around the city. Um, Jerusalem had a huge wall around it, and there were several places you could go in. Um, And this was one of those eight. Um, What's interesting is this was the gate you would use to go straight to the temple. And it kind of had two big openings, kind of like what we came through to come in this morning. Um, They're kind of the area over to the kids' ministry. But if you want to go there and go through there today, uh, you can't. It's actually sealed shut. And it's been sealed and open and sealed again a few times uh, in history because of how important this entry point is into the holy city um, and how you go right into uh, the temple. It's been sealed shut for about 500 years. Uh, But if you're standing in the Garden of Gethsemane or on the Mount of Olives or uh, in Bethany, um, you can see straight across the Kidron Valley and you see this sealed shut on the outer walls of Jerusalem. That's how important and unique this spot is. Uh, You see, because this is all about the glory of the Lord and God's temple. It's not just riding on a donkey and having a fun time. It's the glory of the Lord uh, and the temple. Let me me explain. Uh, When God gave his people instructions for building uh, the tabernacle in the wilderness and later the temple, it was so that he could dwell in their midst, so that his glory would be there in the midst of the people for their worship. And you hear over and over again, the glory of the Lord is in the midst of his people. So when Moses finished, uh, they all built the tabernacle in the wilderness. Exodus chapter 40, verse 34 says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. About 400 years later, after that, they finally built the temple. Uh, Solomon, King David's son, built this majestic structure for the Lord. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, it says the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Now, Solomon's temple uh, was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was beautiful and grand and glorious. And then it was destroyed 
uh, when the people were sent into exile in the Old Testament. And that's where things get a little interesting in terms of Palm Sunday and what's happening today. And you're getting kind of a fast forward view uh, of a lot of Old Testament history all at once. Because once the temple had been destroyed, uh, there's a prophet who comes along, Ezekiel. Maybe you've read Ezekiel's prophecy in the Old Testament. And he actually tells us that the glory of the Lord left the temple. It left the holy city. And and for for God's people in exile, that made a lot of sense. Because if you're in exile, you're like, how in the world did this city get destroyed and this temple get destroyed if the glory of God is here? So Ezekiel lets them know, no, the glory of the Lord departed. And so Ezekiel 8 and 10, it shows step by step. First, Ezekiel sees the glory in the Holy of Holies. And then it moves out into the holy place and then moves to the threshold of the temple. And then it leaves the city through the eastern gate. And it rests on the Mount of Olives and finally it goes off uh, to the east. But that's not the end of the story in Ezekiel. Chapters 40 through 42, Ezekiel says God's going to do a new thing. He's going to give life to dry bones. He's going to bring a new covenant. He's going to bring a new temple. And when that happens, the glory of the Lord, Ezekiel 43 says, will return through the eastern gate. The glory of the Lord will re-enter and fill the temple again. Now, what's intriguing is if you read through the Old Testament, the people go into exile. They're exiled in Babylon and, and they're, they're miraculously allowed to return to the land. And they return, and under Ezra, they, they rebuild the temple. But guess what never happens? The glory never returns. And the people are rarely independent. Empire after empire after empire comes and puts their foot on God's people. And so you can imagine, if you are faithful, you are going, what, what is God doing? Like, we, we have, we're in the land, we have our temple, but we don't have our king, we're not in charge, and the glory never returned. And you can imagine them lingering by that eastern gate, going, eventually, maybe, hopefully, Ezekiel said, the glory of the Lord will come back, be in our midst, and renew us as God's people. So that's what actually happens on Palm Sunday. When we're told that Jesus enters Jerusalem and goes to the temple, he comes through that eastern gate. He comes on a young donkey, fulfilling countless Old Testament prophecies as the righteous, humble, rightful king. The glory of the Lord returning to his people in the person and work of Jesus, the Messiah. Think about it. The city is brimming with people for Passover. It's a festival. It's a huge celebration. And they see Jesus coming on this donkey. He's coming through the eastern gate. And the next thing you know, they're holding palm branches. They're saying, Hosanna, which means save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And he goes through the eastern gate. You can imagine the excitement building like a parade. And then he goes to the temple. And when he gets there, you might remember what happens. When Jesus gets to the temple, um, all heck breaks loose. He overturns the tables. He curses the religious leaders. He goes, you have made my father's house a den of bandits, robbers, insurrectionists. What have you done? That's what happens when the glory of the Lord reveals uh, and comes back and returns to the temple. Um, I love John and his gospel lets us know right at the beginning that this idea of the glory of the Lord dwelling in the midst of his people uh, is central to the work and person of Jesus. In chapter 1 verse 14, John wrote, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt is tabernacled, templed. Jesus is this portable temple, the place and presence of the living God, the glory of the living God. And John says, we have seen his glory, that glory, 
Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. And I talked about the temple a little bit last week, how the earthly temple was a shadow based on the heavenly temple and throne room. The Gospels present Jesus as the place where God is at work. And it actually sets up that showdown between what do we do with the temple that's been built and the temple that's walking around? What's going to happen when they meet, when they collide? And that's when we have Jesus flipping tables and the fiery glory of the Lord returns. And he says, this is not what it's supposed to be about. It's about something else entirely. He condemns the leaders for their violence for their jealousy, for the greed, for the way they'd exploited the poor and excluded the nations. They had shirked their call to be a light to the Gentiles, shirked their call to be on mission and live faithfully. And actually, you you can see that if you just think about the palm branches. Because I don't know about you, when when I think about palm branches, I just have in mind like an elementary school, Sunday school craft. And we, we've got like a cool black and white. We're going to color in the green palm branches and we're going to, it's going to be cute. Palm Sunday is, is the, one of the cutest Sundays of the year. I saw like paper donkeys this morning as we came in. It was amazing. Um, well, let me just tell you, the palm branches are interesting. Palm branches were uh, a sinister symbol in the first century. They actually were a symbol of violence and zeal. Um, a few centuries earlier, and this is where you just have to get this, this sense of Old Testament history and what it was like to be oppressed and just realize if you're there, this is deep in your bones. Nobody has to spell these things out. You know how it works. It's like if you go up to Pittsburgh and there's a Steelers game and they have a terrible towel, you know what's going on. That is a symbol of violence. They are cheering their team on to crush you and your team. See, a few centuries earlier, and, and I, I, was, I was just thinking, man, I think Israel has been oppressed by almost every great empire <laughs> uh, for a long time. I mean, the Egyptians held them uh, in slavery. You have the Assyrians from Iraq. They come and destroy the northern kingdom. You have the Babylonians. Uh, they come and take the people off into exile. Uh, They come back, we've talked about that, they rebuild the temple, but wouldn't you know it, Alexander the Great and the Greeks come, and they take over. And it's during that period of time, which we call between the Old and New Testament, that's often called the silent years, but it's actually really loud. God's people are crying out for deliverance in those silent years, and there is a massive rebellion and revolt that takes place in Israel has to do with these palm branches. See, there's a man, his name is Judas Maccabees. He was known as the hammer. And he was a priest and he was a warrior. He got so upset by what the Greeks did in God's temple that he took up arms to kill them. And he led an entire rebellion. And they actually won. They defeated the Greeks. They drove them out. They had about 100 years of independence. This warrior priest who took up arms to fight the enemies that they perceived to be the enemies of God's people. And after their victory, do you know what they did? They went and got palm branches. And everyone brought in the palm branches to the temple and they cleaned it. They scoured it. It was their way. It was, think about like a broom. It was their way of cleaning everything of this impurity so that they could be there um, in holiness. And again, they actually held independence for about 100 years until the Romans came. So imagine, you're in Jerusalem in the first century. You're waiting for the glory of the Lord. Will it ever return as Ezekiel promised? You're looking at these Roman oppressors And you're like, will will the Lord send someone like Judas Maccabees the hammer, a warrior priest to take up arms and get rid of these foreigners? And so you pick up your palm branch and you go, maybe, maybe this is the guy to finally lead us. He's coming. He's riding a donkey. Okay. I I guess that Zechariah doesn't look too impressive. (laughs) 
doesn't look like much of a warrior. He's riding a young donkey as he comes in. Uh, let's still hold the palm branches. Uh, save us. They meant from the Romans, of course. Um, friends, that rebellion shaped the imaginations and expectations and hopes of the people for who and what the Messiah would be. How many sermons have you heard? They thought Jesus would be like, but he was like this. That's all rooted in this guy, Judas Maccabees, the hammer. Uh, by the way, that event still celebrated today, Hanukkah. Um, they still have a festival to celebrate that great victory. Um, and what's even, even more intriguing is if you look in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 15, we learn that when Jesus comes in and they're holding palm branches, it's not a time of peace. There's just been an insurrection. There are rumblings that the revolt finally might start. They've even got folks in jail who are in jail for murder during the insurrection. One of those guys' name is Barabbas. A few of the other guys ended up on a cross next to Jesus. And so when Pilate eventually asked the crowd, would you like Barabbas or would you like Jesus? They're asking the people, do you want to follow the way of the sword or the way of the lamb? It's not... <laughs> I mean, I always thought Barabbas was just like the worst of humanity. Um, you know, this is Jack the Ripper, this murderer. <laughs> no, he was a local hero. He did what they all wanted to do. Like, he actually took up his sword and fought, took up his dagger and stabbed. They say, do you want Barabbas, the one who's at least willing to fight, or this guy Jesus who came in on a donkey? And they go, man, that guy was not what we were expecting. Like he came into the temple and he lost his stuff. He started flipping tables. He told us we were out of bounds, that we weren't the righteous ones. No, we don't want that. We'll take Barabbas. See how that actually makes sense of these events that are to come this week. Um, it's fascinating. They, those people, they wanted a leader to come and restore their independence. That's who they cheered on Palm Sunday with palms. They wanted to defeat God's enemies. They wanted to cleanse the temple, and Jesus will cleanse the temple, just not in the way they think. He will come, and he will fight for them, just not in the way they would think. And he doesn't fight who they wanted him to fight. He comes against a different enemy. Uh, there's, a, there's a beautiful hymn that's sung on Palm Sunday. Um, we're going to sing it in a little bit. Um, but it's about this ride of Jesus. Here's how it starts. Ride on, ride on in majesty. Hark all the tribes Hosanna cry. O Savior meek, pursue your road with palms and scattered garments strode. You're like, okay, that doesn't sound that majestic. There's coats on the ground. There's a donkey. It's not even like a good donkey. It's a young donkey. Are you kidding? Who got a baby donkey for Jesus? That doesn't seem wise. Well, it's setting up the next, the pivot. The hymn continues, ride on, ride on in majesty, and lowly pomp ride to die. O Christ, your triumphs now begin, or captive death and conquered sin. Just tells us he actually came to fight these other enemies. We think there's all these things we want God to do. And God says, there's a work you need. There's a work to be done in you. There is sin and death and the devil that needs defeating. So I'm going to go to the cross. This counterintuitive victory uh, that we never would have expected. Bishop Leslie Newbegin says that, that the crucifixion of a man should be the manifestation of the glory of God is scandalous. It's as scandalous to Jewish religious hope as it is absurd to Greek philosophy. But it's true. The glory of God is the outpouring of love supremely revealed in the obedience of Jesus unto death. The action of the Father who gives his only son for the life of the world and sustains him in obedience. Paul picks this up in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved it is the power of God. 
this week, those of us who cried out, Hosanna, save us. We have the chance to slow down, to walk step by step, to see all that Jesus did for us and for our salvation, to enter with contemplation and joy upon those mighty acts where God has given us life and life eternal. See, this is a counterintuitive triumph. And don't miss this. In each of the Gospels, when Jesus does go to the temple, it's not just that he is cranky or needed coffee or had a bad day. He goes in and clears out a specific place, and that was actually a space reserved for the nations, for the Gentiles. Even in the temple, they said, here is the court of the Gentiles where everyone can come and worship God. And they had decided, hey, we don't actually need or want everyone to come and worship God, so let's just fill that space with these tables. I think a lot of people here, he overturned the table of the money changers, and we go right to greed, and, and there's, there's that aspect. But it's more so, this is keeping people from worship who are supposed to be here. This is where we're supposed to have room to welcome the nations, welcome the Gentiles, and you guys have filled it up with other things. That's what he comes in. I mean, there's a group of Greeks. They're outside the temple, and they approach saying, sir, we wish to see Jesus. In my mind, I just imagine they try to go where they're supposed to go, the court of the Gentiles. They're like, man, we can't even get in here. There's no room. Hey, hey somebody, we'd like to see the Lord. We'd like to see this Jesus we've heard so much about. And Jesus tells them, if you want to see me, well, the hour has finally come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said, if you want to see me, if you want to know me, if you want to understand the glory of God, look upon the cross. Look upon this act of self-giving love. Look upon uh, this thing that is for us and for our salvation. Look at the death of God. It's shocking. Bishop Newbegin says, why death? He says, death is the visible sign and instrument of God's judgment upon all our lives and all our works. That they are not fit to endure eternally. There's a temporariness. Death is the outward form of God's judgment upon sin. And Jesus, the Son of Man, faces that with the clear eyes which only the sinless Son of God possessed. And so that's the story we're telling today. That's the journey we're about to make as God's people to go through Holy Week, to see what it looked like for the glory of the Lord to return, to see what it looked like for the Son of God to take up arms against sin and death and the devil uh, for you and for me, for a seed to be planted in the ground, because it had to be, that will eventually come forth from the ground in the resurrection and blossom and flourish and give fruit to the entire world. St. Athanasius in the fourth century says, he spread out his hands on the cross. And when he did, he drew the ancient people of God, the old covenant with one hand, and the Gentiles of the new covenant with the other. These people who have been separated and estranged and were locked in hostility, he brings them together in himself through his death on the cross. And so we have the opportunity to adore and to see this, to worship, to bend the knee, to go through Thursday and Friday. And yes, Sunday will come, and we'll love for it to come. But we go slowly through this week. We come to the level ground of the cross, and we kneel. We hear the invitation, take up your cross and follow me making this our story, being invited into it, and finding not just death, but life, eternal life that it starts now and extends into eternity. So I want to close with this. As we begin our contemplation of these mighty acts, that's what the prayer book calls us, this slow journey where we take our time going through this week, um, I came across a meditation from Philip Ryken. He's the president of Wheaton College. And he gives an example of just how counterintuitive all of this is. 
Because I didn't say all that about God's people to say that they were um, wild or they were crazy. Like, it made sense that they would want a Messiah to come and fight for them. It made sense that they were looking for that kind of king. He said, think about how it works to have a king. Usually if you have a king, if you have a ruler, the most important thing you can do is protect that king. He says, the entire game of chess is based on this. You don't let the king fall at any cost. You let anyone take the penalty, anyone get removed from the board except the king. Because when the king is taken from the board, checkmate, game over. You're done entirely. So but think about what Jesus did, the exact opposite. With royal courage, he surrenders his body to be crucified. On the cross, he offers a king's ransom, his life for the life of his people. And he would go on to die for all the wrong things we had ever done or would do, completely atoning for our sins. That crown of thorns that was meant to make a mockery actually proclaims his dignity as a king, even in his death. So this week, let's not just follow a donkey, let's follow the lamb. To walk through Holy Week to see all that our king, King Jesus, has done for us and for our salvation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.